Thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Teddy Sami. I'm the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, also known as NIPSIA, at Carlton University. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on diversifying the contours of uh, the conceptual contours of international relations. I want to thank David uh, for proposing this idea. Uh, today's uh, event coincides with the beginning of Carlton's uh, Inclusion Week. And uh, this speaking event actually marks the launch of an initiative at NIPSIA uh, for a more inclusive international affairs program. I invite uh, everybody to take a look at our website for more details about this. Um, and of course, uh, we're still uh, in the early days of launching this initiative. So any, well, uh, any comment uh, is welcome uh, at this stage. Um, Welcome to our panelists. It's the first time that I get to see you in person. We've never met, but it's a real pleasure to see you all. Um, let me now introduce each one of you. Um, we have Dr. Nathan Andrews. Hi, Nathan, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Global and International Studies at the University of Northern British Columbia. Uh, his expertise and interests are in the areas of global governance and international development in particular the corporate social responsibility of multinational corporations in sub-Saharan Africa. Nathan holds a PhD from the University of Alberta and was a Banting postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University. We also have Dr. Yolande Bouka. Uh, hi Yolande, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. Uh, Yolande is a scholar practitioner whose research and teaching focus on gender, African politics and security political violence, and she does field research in, uh, on ethics in conflict-affected societies. Uh, Yolande holds a PhD in international relations from American University. Last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Sitambile Mbede. Hi, uh, Sitambile, nice to see you. Uh, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria. So she's joining us uh, from quite far, but Great to see you. Uh, where uh, so she's at the University of Pretoria, uh, where she teaches international relations and South African politics. She's also an associate fellow at the Center for Governance Innovation and a visiting researcher at the African Leadership Center at King's College London. Uh, Sitambile holds a DPhil in international relations from the University of Pretoria. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Thanks again, once again, uh, th thanks again for, for organizing this. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to moderate the discussion. Great. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Professor Sami, and, and welcome uh, to everybody who's been able to join us, but a particular welcome uh, to our panelists. It's uh, wonderful to have you with us. So like all disciplines, international relations is regularly evolving. Ideas and understandings of what motivates and underpins international affairs are changing, which has significant implications for how such programs as NIPSIA structures its research, teaching, and its public outreach. Today's panel will explore how the conceptual contours of international relations are changing and diversifying and what this means not only for the academic discipline, but also for the future of foreign policy making. It was Thomas Kuhn in his seminal piece on the structure of scientific revolutions that reasoned that, the, that scientific knowledge is produced from and of a particular time. With changing information, paradigms that once defined or framed how the scientific method was conducted would also change, and so too how evidence was understood and interpreted. Arguably, the same holds true for the study of international affairs. And with that, we have three esteemed panelists here to help us understand more broadly what the future holds conceptually and practically for the study of international relations and the future of foreign policy making. To take us through our time, I have a set of questions that I would like to pose to our panelists to prompt, co prompt conversation. To start, I would like to pose the following to all three to consider and respond to. And that first question really speaks to the overarching aim and objectives of this panel, and that is, what do you think 
are some of the most interesting conceptual considerations currently taking place in international relations scholarship. And I was wondering if we could start with Sitembele. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, David. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. It's great to uh, be here with some old um, and, and, and new friends. Uh, and yeah, it's great to be coming to you from the heat wave we're currently going through in Johannesburg. Um, I think that one of the most interesting reckonings that's going on right now in international relations as um, an academic uh, discipline and as a practice is the reckoning around empire and the role of empire in the formation of the state system, but also of the modern state system, but also the formation um, of international relations as an academic discipline. And for me, it's been particularly interesting um, to see how the conversations evolved in, uh, in the global north um, as somebody that's located in South Africa. Um, because ideas and concepts about the world that seem very obvious from my vantage point here are being grappled with this brand new um, and as a revelation by people and by scholars um, in the North and particularly the kinds of conversations that were happening earlier this year. But it's been also interesting for me to compare that or sit, to sit with that um, in my relations with uh, the diplomatic community in South Africa. So a lot of my work is engaging with diplomats from um, all over the world, um, Canada, Australia, the US, uh, the UK, Ireland, Singapore. And what's been fascinating is how much um, those, a lot of the diplomats from the West are shocked at how prevalent the conversation about colonialism and its relationship with apartheid and how South Africa currently is, um, they are often shocked at how much that is current in the conversation because where they don't come, where they come from, they don't talk about um, colonialism or imperialism or its effects. And they often feel quite um, uncomfortable at having to have that conversation all the time. Um, if you're a British diplomat uh, and having to engage with that all the time when you don't deal with it at all in your training um, as at school or even at university in the study of IR. So I think that the reckoning with uh, imperialism is a really important one for the discipline um, in terms of the practical issues that many parts of the world continue to face. Thanks, Atimile. Uh Nathan, did you want to jump in next? Excuse me, everybody. I have a baby in the in the background, so if you hear the noise, I'm on parental leave starting today. Um, but anyways, I, I I would agree with um, many of the points that um, Sintabili, um has 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 expressed, and I think I had so when 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 I when I heard of this question, the first thing that came to mind, similar to some of the points that have been raised was empire and colonialism. So those are some of the key terminologies that, or concepts that really I find very interesting in, in, in the context of IR. Not that IR has not really engaged with that in the past, or it hasn't ever been in syllabus um, or in, in, in different kind of IR programs. But I think it's, it's really highlighted now because of this sort of focus on, or sort of an understanding of race, racism, and white supremacy in our discipline. So these are some of the additional concepts that would speak to what um, have been expressed already. And when I talk about that, I mean, in, in essence, it's not just an issue of a radical left movement in IR per se, as it is a way of trying to understand the history, the intellectual history and the current situation that we are in. Um, so I think that's why these sort of race, racism and white supremacy um, have become interesting concepts um, of today. And, and in, the, in, the, in the context of IR in particular, I find very interesting that some scholars, what they're doing now 
historian really trace it back to see um, this notion of black internationalism and how black scholars and, and people that were part of the you know, liberation struggle movements um, have contributed something to what we can think of as international politics. But these people were never really recognized for their contribution, also because of colonialism and imperialism and racism and all of that. So I think all of those connect well to, to what we are discussing now. And I, I find, that, find that very striking because IR, as we know it, um, as ha, you know, has been theorized in the past, it's just really an American social science, right? And to some extent, it has changed. It has, you know, it has really become a little bit more diverse. Um, but these topics are really making IR very interesting. And for me, I think IR, when I was doing IR in, 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 my, in my PhD years, uh, about five, five, seven years ago, um, I was really fascinated about, you know, what do you call it? Uh, realism, neoliberalism, constructivism, and all of that, and all the isms, which, which are very important to IR for sure. But I think I'm actually being more fascinated about this sort of look at, really, what are we talking about when we talk about IR? Who are the actors that have been involved? Who are the key thinkers that have been given privilege? Um, and who, why, uh, why did they get that kind of privilege? What, what are the systems that ensured that privilege has prevailed over time? So those are some of the questions that I find very interesting in these days, um, especially within um, the, the current political atmosphere that we live in. Thanks, Nathan. Last but not least, Yolan. Hi. First of all, I'd like to um, echo Sipembele's thanks and thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure um, to be sharing the stage with uh, scholars that I admire and I consider friends and, and colleagues. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't want to repeat what's already been said. Um, I think what's been really interesting to me uh, as an IR scholar is the reckoning of bell hooks coining white supremacist, you know, capitalist patriarchy, right? Looking at the world system and sitting with the idea that uh, military power, economic power, um, have shaped how states are organized and, 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 and puts in, put in hierarchies in the global system, but you have to look at gender, you have to look at race. And what I find interesting about the conversation that we're having in 2020, um, and I just retweeted Robbie Shalem's, you know, kind of interrogation about, you know, the interrogating this uh, resurgence of certain topics, the resurgence of, of conversations about colonialism, the resurgence of, you know, scholarship about race. Um, and what I'm, when I say resurgence, I'm not saying that people st suddenly stop studying or engaging with these topics, but that there's an ebb and flow in which, um, some of these concepts were important in the 1990s, uh, in the 60s and the 70s, and then they disappear from the public discourse about our discipline. And today we're talking about race and colonialism um, as if people have not been engaged with this type of scholarship um, for decades. And as someone who considers herself still a student of international relations, um, I think this lack of humility and this lack of engaging in a genealog genealogical exercise about the origins of some of these debates um, that are not happening uh, in a more sustained way in the academy, um, in the mainstream, uh, risks erasing some of the scholarship that has been done by many of, many of the people who came before us. So some of these conceptual considerations for me um, are interesting, but I, I tread very carefully in, in calling them new trends or new understandings because uh, the reality is that the work has been there. And what I spend a lot of time doing right now is understanding um, where's the scholarship, um, what's already been written, 
and how I can then help my students conceptualize the discipline differently. So, um, you know, this kind of conversation about the racial hierarchies in the international global order um, was definitely not something that I was taught when I was doing my PhD or even my master's. Uh, but I'm trying to introduce these concepts to my students much earlier because the feedback that I receive from them is, how come I didn't get this first year? Or why come, how come I didn't get this at the undergraduate level? So the, the considerations are, may not be conceptual in terms of new considerations, but the pushing towards normalizing the use of this type of scholarship very early on uh, in students' academic career. Thanks very much, Yulon. Um, just before we move to the next question, I wanted to offer Nathan or Sitembele a chance to, or, or Yulon, for any of you to respond to, to what has been said thus far. Great. Seeing seeing that, I wanted to I wanted to just pick up on a theme that I think you know that has come that is consistent across the three of you, and that is some of these uh, this sort of diversification of the conceptual contours have been sort of debates that have been happening for a while, and and it's been sort of ebb and flow type of space where sometimes they're prominent and then they sort of slip back into a, a degree of marginalization. I mean. Sitem Bile, I wanted to, to sort of connect this a little bit to some of the dis debates and discussions that have been going on in South Africa in particular. I mean, you and I both had sort of front row seats to the roads must fall and the fees must fall movements that were largely student, student movements and student driven, which really pitched and, and pushed, I think, some of the uh, conceptual ideas that we, that we were just discussing now, but in the mode and in the framing of decolonization. And I wondered if uh, you were, you'd be willing to reflect a little bit on what decolonization means, I think, for the foundations of IR theory, and really what are some of the opportunities and challenges that are, that are posed by it, as you see it? Thanks. Um, thanks for that question, David. And yeah, we're, we were, I think, last week commemorating the first uh, of the big uh, Fees Must Fall uh, protests at WITS, um, which took place five years ago um, last week. And a lot of what students were calling for then was a, yes, it was about fees, you know, the, the high cost of school fees, but it was also about having a decolonized, decommodified education. And part of what that came from was this feeling of real alienation from what was being taught in the classroom. So the world that was being described in their classrooms didn't match the world that they were living in. And there's a feeling that the information that um, they were be learning, the, the examples being used, the theory being used, um, the analogies being used didn't fit um, their lived experience. And so part of it was about having um, more relevant, um, and appropriate uh, uh, education, but also about revealing the foundations of the things in the areas that we studied. So, you know, at UCT, I studied at UC at the University of Cape Town and used to walk past the statue of Cecil Rhodes every day. Um, going to class and you know i have family in zimbabwe and so knowing just how damaging his legacy was uh in zimbabwe's former rhodesia but also having family um all over the eastern cape of south africa and knowing how damaging his legacy was as governor of the cape in terms of land dispossession in terms of impoverishment um and you know colonialism wasn't just taking control of a place. It was stripping people of land, of wealth, and of dignity. And families then became poor for generations. And even when you, you tried to improve yourself and get a bit of a, a you know, a leg up, um, the system would change again in order to keep you poor because the mining sector of South Africa needed you to be poor so that you'd work in mining to mine gold for Britain. And so um, to have that whole experience 
excluded from what you study and from contextualizing um, the society you live in uh, was something that students were really rallying against, especially because they were, a lot of them were realizing through their own research that this has been written about before. There had been black and brown scholars all over the world who had written about these things, had engaged with each other. So one of my big discoveries was that um, the founder of the ANC, Pixliga Isakaseme, was very good friends with Alan Locke, who was of the Howard School that we are now learning about um, in IR and how his ideas have developed. And they wrote quite extensively in correspondence with each other, but also engaging with this world that was being formed um, in the early 20th century and after the First World War, criticizing Woodrow Wilson and Jan Smuts and, um, and examining what this League of Nations was going to look like. And it seems absurd to me that I never studied any of that in my undergraduate or my master's or my PhD. And it's information that I've come to later in life. And so part of it was about saying, well, we know that our people have played a part in the story of the formation of this world. Why don't we know what that is? And why aren't we taught about it in a university in Africa? Thank you, Sidembele. Um, Nathan, I want to just pick up on, on this theme that of, of the decolonization and the sort of bringing in sort of relevant, contextually relevant types of examples and information and history. I mean, you've, you've been writing a bit lately on sort of the place and space of Africa in, in international affairs and in the theorization, but you've also been talking about it in terms of how we teach uh, international uh, relations. Uh, and in particular, you've been advocating for a move towards creating a discipline that's international, inclusive, decolonial, and pluriversal. I wonder if you could sort of connect us back into what you mean by that, and, and in particular, sort of uh, this idea of decolonization. So I, I would say again that Satem Billy has uh, spoken my mind to some extent in terms of some of the points that she has raised. But what I, what, what I mean, those are big words and those are some of, some of the buzzwords that are thrown around. But I, I, overall, th those, those words that um, you, 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 you've used would, would describe the, the way in which I envisage an IR that is representative of the international that it seeks to, to engage with, right? So what I mean by that is, if you look at the course syllabi that we have around the world, and I say around the world, because I recently did a survey, um, it was just really brief, but I, I looked at 15, top 15 universities in the Western world and top 15 in, in the context of Africa. And I was trying to examine what is really in the syllabi. Um, and, and, and whether things have changed, because most of the syllabi that I was able to get ranged from um, years um, between 2014 and 2019, which is when I actually did the study. Um, and and I, I was actually quite shocked that it, despite all these notions around diversifying IR and the fact that IR has somewhat diversified, it, it, it didn't really show up in the, in, in the syllabi at all. Um, but also when I talk about Western, actually Canada was not listed because of the, the methodology I used. So none of the Canadian institutions was part of the top 15 IR <laughs> institutions because I was using the Times um, Higher Education um, uh, ranking. So I, it, it, it didn't pop up. So 15, you, you could, could rank all the, the Harvards, the Stanfords and Cambridge, Oxford and all of that. And in Africa, we had uh, Cape Town, University of Ghana, um, Stellenbosch and, and, and several of them wits and all that. So I was shocked that regardless of, I mean, not many of the many of the African institutions actually don't have core IR courses and they've actually diversified it in different ways where they are looking at practice. So it's sort of more practice oriented. Um, but those that do have a core IR program with a core IR um, seminar for graduate students didn't have um, really a syllabi that I would say 
looked totally different from what would be in the Western world, right? Um, the University of Ghana, for instance, I was shocked. There was this sort of phrases in there that said that the, the instructor was actually saying that, well, these are the, the classicals and I would want students to be exposed to it because they are sort of the heartbeat. Of the, of the field and those sort of the heartbeat of the field of study. That's sort of the words that were used in that, syllab in that syllabus. And I was very shocked because I think in, a con in some contexts, it makes sense to still be following the teleology of realism, neorealism, you know, liberal institutionalism, constructivism, blah, 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 and maybe feminism if you're lucky. Um, but in, 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 in many contexts, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. You have to begin thinking about IR from a different perspective, by right? exposing students to certain types of concepts and ideas that would help the students really understand what, what they are studying if later on they, they even if later on they read about realism and all of that. If you begin with some sort of context, um, that really showcases different perspectives. The fact that IR is not coming from one part of the world, right? Because if you read realism, liberalism, and all of that, that's what you would think, because a bunch of white men that wrote these articles and books, and so you would think that other people cannot think, other people cannot write, other people cannot contribute to this discipline, or have never contributed to this, this discipline that we call IR. Um, so what I mean by pluriversal is just the opposite of universal, that you know, we are not thinking of IR as really proposing universal truths about the world, about the state, about state-to-state -state interactions, about state-to-non-state -state, um, actors' interactions. But IR actually can propose a, a range of, 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 of ideas, a range of perspectives that actually represent the world. And when I talk about a range of perspectives, one of it, um, rationality, for instance, is one of the ideas that is very central to core IR. The fact that people are supposed to be behaving as rational human beings, decision makers and foreign policy makers are supposed to be rational. And, and so if, if, if certain types of behaviors do not align with the way IR has been theorized to be rational, then it, it, it doesn't seem to make sense for, again, Western IR. But in some other context, if you think of relationality, if you think of um, the fact that we have this sort of collective um, view towards things, you will see a totally different perspective from what we've been taught as rationality in IR. So this is one of the ways. And so overall, what the, the point I'm making is that how we teach IR really has a key role to play in, 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 in what the students and what the future generation really get out of it. So we need to begin by looking at how do we decolonize IR? We have to begin with a textbook. We have to begin with a syllabi that we have. And we have to begin to think of how do we restructure the syllabus in a way to, to, to tell a different history um, and not just a single story of the discipline, but a story that is very representative of how big and how broad the discipline is supposed to be. I mean, I can say more, but I'll leave room for others to jump in and I'll come in again. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Nathan. And I just wanted, before we, we move to Yolanda, I just want to note that, you know, you can ask questions in the uh, message box. We will try and get to them uh, as we sort of complete our, our sort of formal uh, bits of questioning here. But Yolanda, I wanted to give you an opportunity now to contribute to this discussion of, of decolonization and, and what it means for international relations. And in particular, you know, I, I want to draw reference to the recent uh, foreign policy piece that you co-authored uh, with some scholars um, that really sort of sought to challenge the idea of the history of racialized international political analysis. And uh, in it, you, you, pro you challenged us, you challenged us as a community uh, to get comfortable looking at race in the face, as you as a, put into quotation marks. So really on that score, what, what needs to occur within the discipline of international relations, within foreign policy making, to not only enable this, but to embrace it? So I think there are two things that I'd want to focus on as I, I think about this question of how do you look at race in the face in international relations? And the first thing is related to our need to um, dig deep into our myth of origin. So in comparative politics, when you study identity, um, you know, we try to figure out how does a group of people um, create a narrative that frame the boundaries of belonging or being excluded from a particular group. 
So there has been some fantastic scholarship um, in the past decades about understanding the relationship between foreign policy post-World War, First World War, and Second World War uh, foreign policy and the emergence of Western IR. Now I say Western IR writ large because there's kind of the, some of these European schools and the American schools, right? Um, but not, when I say getting comfortable with understanding our myth, our myth of origin, it, it goes back to what Nathan was saying, this kind of um, deconstruction of our pedagogical approach to teaching international relations. Once we understand the relationship between the discipline and foreign policy, uh, power and empire, then we can start thinking, okay, so what are the different ways in which we can conceptualize how power is organized? Race always comes up if you do a, a proper analysis of these things, yeah? Um, I love what um, Olivia Rutazibwa recently was interviewed and she said, IR is fiction. IR is fiction. It's not um, universal. It's a story that we create about how we understand various events in the world, how power moves and shifts over time, and who's on top and who's on the bottom, if, there's, if that's the way we choose to conceptualize power. And that takes me to the second point of the violence of erasure. Yeah, so once you understand your myth of origin of the discipline, then you can start looking at the holes. Uh, when Sidembele talks about students who are frustrated when they're sitting in their classes and they're being talked about histories of wars and conflicts and peacemaking and institution building, and we're not talking about their institutions, what um, institutions, contributions are erased from our analysis, which then force us to see power centered in a very particular locale um, and people from a particular region of the world making all the decisions, erasing the contributions, um, erasing the developments and erasing the institutions, the intellectual philosophies of various types of people. So for me, you can't comfortable in the long term looking at race in the face if you don't do this type of homework first. What is your myth of origin? What is the complicity between those who were at the base of, of, of extending their empire around the world and area studies and international relations? How do you understand the other to subjugate the other? Yeah. Um, and if you normalize kind of this, this, you know, there's this, this approach to global international relationship. Well, as Andrew, was, as, sorry, as Nathan was saying, well, you know, how do you conceptualize rationality? Because if you sit in various um, IR courses and you study warfare in Sub-Saharan African, for instance, senseless violence, because the violence is always senseless, it's always irrational, right? Um, it's because you've pathologized the other, you've pathologized the way of thinking of the other. So all the intellectual, cultural, institutional footprint that, should you, that you should recognize in understanding an international relation disappears. And I, I, I find this to be, uh, ontologically and epistemologically, it's violent to do that type of erasure. So sitting and being comfortable with looking at race in the face requires you to interrogate, you know, our myth of origin informs how we understand not only the scholarship, but foreign policy. It informs um, whether the U.S. considers it to be normal to be at perpetual war in the Middle East. It informs, um, you know, uh, what we consider failed states in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's amazing scholarship by uh, Zubairu Wai, you know, who talked about this kind of myth of sovereignty. Uh, if we are able to deconstruct that, then 
race becomes one of the many lenses through which we understand how power is organized into international relations. It allows us to step away from pathologizing um, the other and really understanding that we, what I want to see in international relationship is not diversification. What I want to see is a transformation of the conversations we're having. A syllabus is a tool to tell a story. We need to tell a different story. If you do really take a global approach to international relations, a gendered approach to international relations, a racialized approach to international relations, and an approach that also takes into consideration class, we won't be telling the same story, whether we're in South Africa, we're in Singapore, we're in Latin America, but we will feel a certain uh, ability to be more fluid in how people understand power from their, their, their points of view. Great, thank you very much, Yulon. So, I mean, it, there's an interesting set of considerations across the three of you in these, in these sort of three questions, and it namely comes down to sort of how inclusive can international relations be of other types of ideas, right? Like, particularly from other disciplines, I'm hearing a strong historical uh, element here, uh, obviously a very strong gendered analysis as well. Uh, I'm just wondering about, is, is the problem of international relations in terms of how we conceptually deal with this primarily rooted in the attempt to make it static, to make it a science, to you know, not contest these baseline concepts on regular occasion? Is it because we're, we're trying to be too much of a whole discipline as opposed to something that is, should be made up of multiple different disciplines? Uh, who would like to start? Yolande, would you like to take, a, take the first stab at that? I think it's, it's part of it. I think it's this, um, this resistance to seeing the world from the point of view of, of, of other people. And, and the resistance has to do with um, and I, I, for, for fear of repeating myself, this kind of complicity between the people who make decisions in Washington, D.C., uh, and their influence in the, at the World Bank or at the IMF or um, at the UN more broadly. Um, if you, I remember, I, was, I, was, I did all my, my, my university studies in the United States. And I remember I was in the U.S. during 9-11. And if you were if you were studying anything else but Middle East at that time, you got, it was very difficult to get any types of funding, right? So academic funding to do research was redirected towards the foreign policy imperatives of the US government at the time. So I think if you look at that relationship, it really then gets to inform it. And there's also another conversation to, to be said about the political economy of knowledge production about IR, about area studies, and in the case of Africa, about how do we understand Africa. So if you, you look at the ways in which these things are interlinked, it may explain why, you know, there's such a limited way in which some of us have been trained, because it's not all of us, yeah? Some, if, you, if you listen to some scholars who were studying in the 1970s and 60s in Tanzania and Uganda, all these schools of international relations who were trying to push against that uh, were quite successful in, in ingraining kind of this diversity of a worldview. But the, you know, capital, capitalism also informs our discipline. Who gets published, what kind of books, what types of presses, all these things that influence what we consider to be respectable scholarship. And, and, and that, unfortunately, I think, influence our discipline. Sitin Bele, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I, this idea, I think that certainly this idea of IR wanting to be a science and to have this objective view of uh, the world uh, definitely contributes to the inability of IR as a discipline to confront different conceptions and different conceptualizations um, of the world and of reality. It made me think of uh, a paper written um, by Vinit Thacker and Peter Vale um, 
and Alexander Davis uh, that was published in Millennium 2017 uh, called Imperial Mission Scientific Method and Alternative Account of the Origins of IR. And their alternative account basically places um, the origins of IR in Johannesburg in South Africa uh, with the men who were part of Alfred Milner's kindergarten, um, the, the, the group of young British um, civil servants, Lionel Curtis, who went on Philip Kerr, um, who then went on to be very influential in the formation of Chatham House. Um, and Philip Kerr was the British um, ambassador to the US during the Second World War. And basically, they make the argument that the model on which they, that, that, that IR was built on as an academic discipline on the model that they used to understand um, the British role build the argument for the development of the Union uh, of South Africa. And what I find um, particularly intriguing about that account of the development of the IR is this overemphasis on objectivity and science by colonizers in their colonies. There's always a and, and there's always this argument that you are uh, going to run a place scientifically, and um, and so you erase the, the the culture, the language, the practice of the people there because it's uncivilized, and you um, apply the scientific way of doing things, and that's very much at the and even when you look at the US, uh, at the development of IR in the US, it's based in, in Robert Vitalis's work um, about how that core running through it is this idea that you're going to build the subjective science of, of, of race and, um, and, and, and empire. And so that legacy and that heritage of IR, I think is definitely at the heart of the discipline's inability to evolve. Um, and the disciplines need for universalizing, um, and it makes me think. It just there's a there's a uh, there's a comment here by Tag, I think, uh, saying IR seems to have a color, hence IR in the eyes of who, from what legacy. If IR in the heart and eyes of Africa, which Africa? There is little in common between the Ibo the. Tigre, the Dinka, and the Zulu, other than color and geographic location of Africa. Is there a stand, un, standard university, universally recognized concept of IR? And for me, part of what we need to do with um, this pluriversal vision is to challenge that. So for me, I challenge the notion of Africa um, as this monolith um, or as a universal concept because, or as a shorthand um, in IR, because it's not. The African continent is massive. It includes the whole of North America, Latin America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, China, India, Australia. So one of the first things I do in my introduction to IR class is to show students that map of the real map of Africa, uh, because even Africans have no notion of how big how geographically vast the continent is and we have no notion of how many people actually live here and all of those different experiences and so part of it is about highlighting the differences between the Zulu and the Dinka and um, and the and the Igbo and the Herero, but also through then highlighting all of those differences of culture, of practice, of language, um, then also drawing what the similarities are of the common experience of racialization, of colonization, um, of being in in the periphery of the global uh, political economy. And that allows you to then provide or, or have a far richer understanding of what Africa actually is and how Africans relate to each other. Because part of the problem is that in, you know, when, and David, you taught in South Africa, so we don't often think about inter-African relations as international relations. 
<laughs> so, you know, and international exchange is going to Europe. It's not going to Ghana. Uh, but that is an international exchange that is that is that is useful and valuable and and where you can learn a great deal. And then just a second thing, just want to respond to to Yulan's point about um, this idea of rationality in African conflict, and that is a huge one. I study the UN and. Uh, and studied South African foreign policy within the UN Security Council. And one of the remarkable things about the way in which African conflicts are talked about in the UN is as this pathological, irrational thing. And the ideas of conflicts over resources, uh, over land, what the impact of climate change is on people's movement patterns, that gets lost completely. Um, and that then informs the kinds of peace missions that are deployed on the continent, what is funded, what isn't funded, um, when a confident conflict is declared over, uh, and what peace building looks like. And so these conversations aren't just esoteric or, um, you know, navel gazing by an academic discipline. They have real life effects on, um, on the lives of millions, on one point, the lives of 1.3 billion people um, on the African continent. Thanks very much, Tatembele. Uh, Nathan, did you want to contribute to this question? Um, I will quickly say a few points. I think many of the points have been uh, raised already, but I, I would point to um, one article wrote by um, Amita Vachaya and um, Barry Buzan in 20, um, 2007. I think they were talking about why there is no non-Western IR theory. And they provided three justifications um, of at least ways in which we can conceptualize it. One of said, well, perspectives should receive substantial acknowledgement by others in the IR community as being theory. And secondly, they should also be self-identified by the creators as being IR theory, even if not acknowledged in the mainstream um, community. But also, thirdly, they should be constructed in a manner that can be identified as systematic, um, a systematic attempt to abstract or generalize about the subject matter of IR. So, I mean, this, these, these sort of criteria really point to the fact that everything we're talking about in IR theory, contributions, socially constructed for the most part by who determines, um, and as, as Yolande was saying, who determines who gets published, who determines who gets into the top journals. And most, most syllabi would want to have a few of those known names in the top journals in there, right? Because you can have a syllabi that, I mean, a syllabus that really basically contains um, articles that were published in World Development, which is a good journal, but it, you would need to have some papers in an, a typical IR journal for it to be considered a good syllabi. And I think this is one of the, the requirements that we have that really prevent us from expanding the canons of IR. And I think the idea of being a discipline and being very canonical. So IR is actually one of the most canonical disciplines that we can find. Like we, we stick to things and we don't want to break loose of those. But also it's because of the hegemony of knowledge, epistemic hegemony that determines what contributes as knowledge and what does not contribute as knowledge, right? So you can decide to publish things all you want about black internationalism and all of that, but it may never really be accepted in world politics. It may never really be accepted in international organization. Um, but why are those even, why are those top journals, top journals? They are top journals because we see them as top journals, I guess, in the field. Um, we have privileged them as top journals. We keep referencing them. We keep citing things that have, that have been published in them. But if we stop doing all of that, then eventually they don't become the top journals. Other things that could be published in other centers of the world could eventually become the new norm. So I think it's just a way of sort of flipping things around by practicing, by doing, not so much talking about it, right? So the, the, the sort of emphasis on IR theory, we are so in, invested in theory that anything else that everyone, anyone else does seems to be uh, just a critique of the theory <laughs> and not so much a substantive contribution to IR. Um, so I think that's one of the core things. It's like so fascinated um, by what is theory and, and why theory is useful um, to what we do. Thanks very much, uh, colleagues. So coming to the, the last question I have uh, for our panel, and I know that we have, we have about nine minutes left. 
really, I mean, we, so we've been talking a lot about the conceptual contours of the discipline and how to sort of broaden that out, how to think about it more diversely and in, and in ways that aren't sort of traditional. What about, you know, let's, let's, start, let's recognize a, a fact here, right? We, we aren't all just training the international relations scholar of tomorrow. We're not training just new academics, but we're also training people to be foreign policymakers, to engage in the actual practice of foreign policymaking. As we sort of come to grips with um, the need to be more inclusive, to broaden our conceptual horizons, what do you think, what, what are the implications of that for foreign policymaking uh, of tomorrow? How do, we, how do we sort of prepare our students to engage in foreign policymaking? And I will note that we do have some, some policymakers here on the call with us, so I hope that uh, they sharpen their pencils and, and take notes. Um, could I start with Sitembele, perhaps, for this question? Sure. Um, I, as somebody who, you know, at the University of Pretoria, many of our students want to go on to be policymakers, and I, this is very important to me, and I think that part of changing the way in which we teach IR is about changing the images that the policymakers have when they are making decisions about the world um, and, and interventions. And so, for example, one of the things that always strikes me is that the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa is taught as a human rights struggle and there's a liberal human rights struggle. Um, when many of the freedom fighters and the people that were involved saw it as a struggle for sovereignty and freedom. Um, and so, and then you learn IR, you study IR and you get told that there's this tension between the notion of sovereignty and, uh, and liberal definitions of human rights. But the culture in which I learned about liberation, freedom, human rights is one where those things are inseparable. And so what does that mean then for somebody who is a diplomat from South Africa who's now engaging with a Canadian diplomat about um, the a particular um, resolution at the Human Rights Council. And so no wonder they are the thing of the world because one half of the world is not being taught how to understand um, the other. And in the um, non-dominant part of the world, there is such a disjuncture between how you are taught formally to understand the world, so the syllabi, and your lived experience of the world that it creates this um, to use Du Bois's term, this double consciousness um, and this confusion about how you exist um, in, in the world. So I think that there is a definite practical um, value in changing the way in which we teach IR. And I just want to pick up on a, converse, on a question from Reynolds. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly around language. The other idea that, um, you know, that IR is such an English discipline, an English language discipline. And even those in the developed world or in the global South that then benefit, that are able to enter into um, the core of IR do so, because they speak English and they speak English well. And so how do we reframe the dominance also of English in IR, both in the discipline, but also in the practice of it? Because as somebody that has grown up in a country with 11 official languages, language is meaning and is reality that you can't conceptualize something in a language means that you won't experience that reality. And that seems obvious to me as somebody that's grown up in a multilingual society, um, that I think that the, the English dominance of IR is certainly something that we need to think about. Thanks, Tim Billy. Uh, Yolande? So, I recently drafted a chapter <clears throat> that is, um, in a forthcoming book by, uh, edited by um, Megan McKenzie on um, what if we develop foreign, a foreign policy as if Black people mattered. 
right? Um, and I actually started drafting this thing before um, the, the current revolution. So when I finished it in the midst of it, um, it, it definitely had something more meaningful to me by the end. But um, it's a, a difficult conversation to have um, sometimes with people who work in foreign policy, who are policy analysts, who are often working uh, from an emerging threat or emerging threat uh, th trend position. So I, before I worked, before I came back to academia, I used to work for the Institute for Security Studies, a think tank based in South Africa, but I worked out of the Nairobi office. And, you know, I, I was working in a conflict prevention and risk analysis um, bureau where we worked on the Great Lakes region, looking at conflict trends, prevention, and di diplomacy. And when we're talking about changing paradigms, uh, changing the way in which we teach IR and changing paradigms, we're not simply talking about diversifying who sits on the syllabus. We're not simply talking about having more BIPOC scholars work on the syllabus. We're really thinking about having a different conversation about who matters. For me, one of the challenges as a feminist, um, one of the challenges of international relations as a discipline is, you know, how rigid we are in our levels of analysis and then how the state becomes everything, even though we know there are different other levels of analysis. And the, what if we had an approach to foreign policy that centered the individual, not from a white saviorism concept where we're going to save the Africans or we're going to save um, you know, people in Latin America, but from the perspective that individuals have agency, they have vulnerability, they have creativity to solve their own problems, they have strength, they have capacity. They have challenges, um, particularly in contexts where the state itself lacks legitimacy uh, in relationship to the people that the state is supposed to govern over. Right? So having a type of foreign policy that is not only focused on, let's say, if you look at the, the war on terror in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, where um, Africa has become the frontier of militarization where you're using unmanned armed vehicles to deal with security issues without thinking about what we call collateral damage. You know, the people who end up being in the crossfire of, of, of this, type, this type of weaponry. And then thinking about the ways in which foreign policy then often comes back home to root, you know? If we're using drones in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and in Niger, what does it mean for the people who pay the tax dollar money of these drones? Not just in terms of financial costs, but how these drones will come home for surveillance uh, and as it was done during the recent protests. So linking people to people's needs, people to people's engagement with the international. And I think to me, uh, when I was having conversations with diplomats about, you know, security situation in, in Burundi and around Rwanda, Uganda, and so forth, you know, understanding that individuals have rationality and have agency and will navigate the constraints the way they can, they can based on where they position, sometimes it was difficult for people to understand. It wasn't simply that you know, a pre said president in a country was stubborn and wanted to stay in power, but there was an entire network around him and foreign policy imperative, not based on said president's relationship with France, Belgium, or the United States, but based on said relationship with other leaders in the region. If we take this kind of approach of, that breaks away from the state focus of IR, and we act as if people of color mattered, uh, I think we develop different foreign policy. And it may sound like a utopia, and it may sound like something that is not practical, but for me, I don't think you'd build better foreign policy 
without these types of lenses. Thank you, Elon. Uh, Nathan. I see that we are running out of time, so I'll just be brief here. I, I think, um, in addition to all that um, have been said already, I, I will say the foreign policymakers need to really go into the field with some critical introspection by trying to sort of imagine um, or think of the people that they will be engaging with as actors that are not just um, receiving you know, knowledge from, from above, but actors that actually have agency actors that are able to have some sort of power to be able to, it also sort of determines how we define power, right? Because we think of power as something that is held in the global north and the global south never really has any power. Then that really <laughs> doesn't help us move forward with that sort of understanding. But I think if we do understand it from a different perspective, then we will be able to say that, well, we are engaging with these actors, not just as recipients of aid or recipients of foreign policy um, or policy instruments, but they actually are contributors to what we think of as international. They are contributors to world politics and they have agency, they have power in their own right. So you're not going there to put in any sort of mechanisms that would empower certain groups of people, um, but you, you see them as already empowered to come to the table. And you see them as, as such, not just think of them, but actually you, based on your interaction with them, you, you, you show that you, you think of them as not just um, receivers, but you think of them as co-equals in some ways in, in understanding the world that we live. But I think that sort of critical understanding really helps us um, think of others, not just as others, but others as people that have perspectives, people that have opinions, people that have um, ways of doing things that we need to make sense of, that we don't just need to disregard as irrational, that we don't just need to disregard as rogue, um, but things that we really have to make sense of in order to, to really embrace this notion of foreign policy making. So just briefly, because we ran out of time, but yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks, Nathan. And sorry to uh, sorry to sort of have the the constraints put on us. Uh, we do have a few extra minutes, and I just did want before we wrap up um, give uh, give sight to my colleague Lama Murad's uh, question in the in the chat box, which is actually uh, ref reflecting on Yulan's provocation around changing the conversation and as theme that I think has been um, echoed by all the panelists, but. I think particularly she's asking here about whether or not having meaningful networks between different sites of study um, is actually a good strategy. And I mean, I think it comes back to a question that emerged in my mind as we sort of talked about accepting context as relevant to our understandings of international relations. How do we, how do we create a set of conversations across those different contexts that then help us understand perhaps a more uh, I, I don't want to use the word universal, but I think you'll understand what I mean when I, when I refer to it, universal understanding of IR. Um, Yvonne, would you like to start with that? Yeah, I'm reading her question right now, and uh, thank you, Lama. Um, it's good to, to have you with us. Um, I think, first of all, this idea of creating different centers of knowledge is absolutely essential. It's critical. Um, and the reason why I say this is because if you decenter the convert, at least according to me, if you decenter the, the the locations where these conversations are taking place, then ideas that are perceived to be critical, maybe in some circles, don't have to suffocate and die. There's a space in which some of these conversations can take place. So when you're talking to me about the Beirut School of International Studies. Well, I'm thinking, okay, how does it enter with, you know, X School of International Security or, or, or International Studies? I was tickled when I found out that this was, had opened or was working on opening a, an African Center for the Study of the United States. Because yes, it is also necessary for people based in Southern Africa and, and, and people who come to study in, in South Africa to have a conversation about how do we study the other? How do we understand and what perspective do we have? I mean, at the moment, comparative people who do comparative politics based in Africa are having a very interesting moment looking at what's happening in the United States. 
Um, I think the important thing when you start these types of institutes or centers or networks that are developed in a particular region is ensuring that there is a dialogue with various parts of the world, right? So um, I look at my colleague, Amin Yang, who's at WITS as well, who spent some time in, time in Brazil, you know, doing research, but also developing relationships with scholars. When we talk about the global south, and the global north is that big, the global south is everything else. So I, maybe we need also to have a different conversation about the terminology. But um, the solidarities that are built uh, can only enrich the discipline. And I find myself, and when I start having conversations with uh, Lusophone scholars or Hispanophone scholars or Francophone scholars, even though I'm Francophone, but I work in the Anglo world, uh, my understanding of history, of perspective, of philosophy, of geography even, uh, is tremendously enriched. And that enrichment can then be passed on to my students and to my own work. Um, so absolutely, I think we need to decenter. When we talk about decentering um, the, 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 the centers of knowledge, it's not just intellectually, but it, it, it is linked to linguistic decentering, to geographical uh, decentering as well, as long as we keep conversations among our, our centers. And that's where the West, in my view, has been very weak, is because you've only had conversation across the ocean between North America and Europe, and not genuine conversations with centers in Asia and Africa. Africa and in Latin America. Thanks, Yolande. Nathan, uh, do you want to go next? Um, yeah, just a couple of quick, quick points. So I do agree that networks um, would be useful to sort of move in this agenda forward. And I, in the recent past, I've been involved in two roundtables. One was held in, Ist in Istanbul um, in 2019, um, 2019 last year. And then the other one was held earlier on in this year in, uh, in Doha. And these, these are just ex examples of some conversations that have been happening in the global south. And I think there has been particular attention paid to having those conversations in the global south. I know a lot of is happening in the global north. I know Millennium Journal always have nice, interesting conferences where they do discuss these things. But I think having centers of um, sites of knowledge production elsewhere really plays a role too. So if these sort of networks are going to happen, then these networks have to really operate from a different site, um, if, if possible. But even if when they do operate from a, a Western um, site um, or a Northern site, it should still involve a diverse group of scholars, right? I see, I see the utility of doing that. And the one reason why is I noted earlier on that IR is probably the most canonical discipline is that some of these uh, networks, um, these um, engagements are already happening in other, other, other contexts, such as comparative policy or development studies, right? Where you know, there's this sort of drive towards bottom up. And so there's these ways of uh, having research um, collaborations with different people from different parts of the world. In IR, I don't think such collaborations are happening so much, because then again, it's just a way of understanding the other, a way of trying to think of IR as not just, you know, focused on power politics of the most, you know, powerful countries, but the politics that involves the, the world as a whole, right? So I think that's, that's a very important consideration that we need to think about when we are thinking of diversifying the contours of, of, of this, this um, discipline that we, have, we are very um, excited and familiar with. Thanks, Nathan. And last but not least, uh, Sitembele. Uh, thank you. Uh, without repeating what my colleagues have said, which I agree with completely, but building on what Ilan was saying about decentering, I think part of it is about shaking this idea that the West has expertise on everything, that Europeans or white people have expertise on everything. Uh, so part of my frustration and that of a few of us here in South Africa around the way that our government responded initially to the COVID-19 crisis is that we looked for lessons about how to deal with um, the crisis from the West, both and a bit from China, when Senegal in Africa was the 
has managed the COVID-19 crisis the best, I think, of, amongst the best in the world. Um, but the experience of countries that had gone through Ebola, so Senegal, Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria would have actually served us far better uh, in that immediate period of having to deal with, uh, with, with COVID-19. And yet many of the analogies, the experiences that were being uh, referenced were from, um, were from other parts of the world. So part of it is about breaking this idea that the West and can be experts in everything. They can't. And part of decentering is also decentering around subject matter, that the West can't be an expert in every possible subject in international relations. And I think that letting go of that idea uh, will allow for these kinds of organic formations um, to form in, in, in the discipline. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Stimbele. And, and as I draw the, the panel to a conclusion, I just want to reflect and say what a fantastic set of insights and provocations. So thank you very much, Dr. Andrews, Dr. Buka, Dr. Mbete for joining us today to kick off this uh, important set of conversations that NIPSIA wants to have and that IR uh, needs to embrace. Uh, so thank you for the time. Thank you for the insights and many thanks to all the participants as well for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, colleagues. Good job.